One day when I was out of school for the summer, I saw some boots on the shelf way up high in my dad's closet. I got the ladder like I wasn't supposed to and climbed up to get them. I wondered why they were so dusty. So I carried them to my dad and told him I found his old boots. I asked him why he never wore them. He didn't answer me. He took me outside on the porch and we sat on the steps. I just knew I was in trouble. He placed the boots one step below us and told me they belonged to my Uncle Brian and that he died before I was born, so I never met him. Dad picked up one of the boots and dusted it off a little and then said to me, those boots, he used them when he fought in the war. I didn't know what war he was talking about, so I picked up the other boot and dusted it off like he was doing. I told him that I had never been in a war. He just smiled. Then he said, that's why he did it, son. So you wouldn't have to. Good morning, church, and welcome. The Bible says in John 15, 13, greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. This morning, we would like to remember those who have paid the ultimate sacrifice. If you have lost a family member, a friend, or someone you've served with, please stand. In order to appropriately honor the memory of those who have paid the ultimate sacrifice, preserving our freedom, will you please stand with them as well for a moment of silence? Lord, as we come to you today, we want to thank you and praise you for all um, that have served in this country. I know there are many heavy hearts today. Just be with the service today, be with the music and the worship, and uh, be with Micah as well. Just speak through him. Lord, um, just be with those that are not here, that are traveling, Lord, just keep them safe. I think of Pastor Mike and his family as they're traveling, Lord, just keep them safe. In your name we pray, amen. Hey, we're excited you guys have joined us here today. If you haven't already done so, if you guys could fill out a Connect card through our app, the QR code, or you can use a physical card and go ahead and fill that out. We would love to connect with you. We, we want to know that you're here, um, and it gives you an opportunity to just write a prayer request. So that way we can pray for it as a staff. Before we sing, look to the person next to you, say good morning. Thank you guys for being So, you called me from the grave by name. You called me out of all of my shame. I see the old has passed away. The new has come. Aren't you thankful this morning that the old has passed away? Sing it out with us today as we talk about and we sing about resurrection power. Your royalty, your 
us freedom. You have given us freedom. My chains are gone.
may be seated. This next song we're going to sing, it's a familiar one, but it's, a, it's an amazing way and a beautiful way to lift high the name of God and just to stop for a minute and picture how worthy he is of our praise. This is Revelation song and we're going to tag it with Agnes Day. If you know it with us, sing along. Struck one. 
Bibles. Turn to Jonah, chapter number four. And God is so great. And God is so holy. He's worthy of every bit of praise that we could ever offer. I'll say that to my dying day because I know it's going to be true to my dying day. Jonah chapter number four. I'm going to read all 11 verses. I'll begin reading in verse one. You'll join me in two. And you'll read all the even verses down through the end of the chapter. <clears throat> Jonah chapter four should be up on the screen. Verse one says, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God, and merciful, slow to anger, and great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Then said the Lord, Doest thou well to be angry? So Jonah went out of the city, and sat on the east side of the city, and there made him a booth, and sat under it in the shadow, till he might see what would become of the city. And the Lord God prepared a gourd, and made it to come up over Jonah, that it might be a shadow over his head, to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceeding glad of the gourd. But God prepared a worm when the morning rose the next day. 
and it smote the gourd that it withered. And it came to pass, when the sun did arise, that God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah, that he fainted, and wished in himself to die, and said, It is better for me to die than to live. And God said to Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? And he said, I do well to be angry, even unto death. Then said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on the gourd, which has not labored, neither madest it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should I not spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your grace and your mercy, and I thank you for your love for us. I thank you for all that you've done for us in saving us and, 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 and calling us your children, Lord, and, and, and giving us a home in heaven. And we're so thankful for that. Father, I pray that uh, you would use this time as uh, we hear your word preached, that you would speak to our hearts. And Lord, if there's one in here that doesn't know you as Savior, I pray that you would soften their heart today. And Lord, that they would receive you as Lord of their life. We thank you so much for your grace and mercy. Bless in Jesus' name. Amen. I think one of the things that we often forget is just how much the culture shapes Christianity, and it's not just Christianity that shapes the culture. Many of our deeply held beliefs may actually be more connected to America or our ancestral beliefs than they are actually connected to the Bible. Because oftentimes we accept what we feel or what we think because of our environment without ever actually questioning it. And this is the story that we find Jonah walking into. If you look at Jonah chapter number one and verse number one, it says, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh. Now I want to pause there, and we need to talk about Nineveh. What is so significant about this story? Well, if you remember, the world was so wicked that God only found one righteous person. There was so much violence, so much wickedness, so much corruption. God was like, there's literally nothing I can do to change these people other than to start over. So there was one man named Noah, and he had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. You know the story. And one of his sons did something odd, weird. Noah was drunk in his tent and unclothed, and Ham went in and went back to his brothers and made some comments. And you can study 10 different PhD doctrinal theologians, and they'll all have a different opinion on what happened. But what we know is Ham did something sinful. But what's interesting is in the story, Noah does not curse Ham. He curses his son, Canaan. He curses his grandson for something his father did. Now, I want to stop there and say this. There are two ways to look at curses in the Bible. They are either God giving some man the power a, a man who was just recently drunk, to put an everlasting curse on a grandson, or we can see it as simply a prophecy of sin being passed from one generation to another and the consequences. We have an, a, phrase, a phrase in our culture that goes, the sins of the fathers are passed on to the, the sons. I used to think that was in the Bible, but it's actually not. But the concept is certainly there. And so the Ninevites are actually the descendants of one of Ham's grandchildren, and his name was Nimrod. He was a mighty hunter, a violent man. And now we see 1,500 years later, the violence has spread, and the Ninevites were actually known for going and pillaging Jonah's people, taking their heads and piling them up like pyramids in front of the city walls. That's a pretty horrendous group of people, wouldn't you agree? And would you not also agree that Jonah, having seen his people slaughtered, would have a justifiable disdain for the Ninevites? Would you also agree with that? So what we have in this story is a history of a violent, wicked, God-hating people group, and then you have Jonah who comes from God's chosen people. And what we see here is, is the power of our parents or the power of our culture to shape us. Even the power 
of our own experiences. Let me give you an example. Certain names or titles bring up certain feelings. If I say the title Alabama Crimson Roll Tide, what do you feel? Now, if Pastor Mike were here, I would have got a standing ovation and a hallelujah, praise God, right? Some of you, you feel a little bit nauseous in your chair. You're feeling a little bit sick right now. Like he just cursed in church, I'm out of here. What do you feel when I say, now don't answer out loud, okay, don't answer out loud, but what do you feel when I say Republican? What do you feel when I say Democrat? What do you feel when I say Joe Biden? Barack Obama, Trump, DeSantis. Oh, sorry, not, not supposed to do that, not supposed to do that. You see, different titles evoke different emotions and responses from us. What about father, mother? Sometimes Father, in, in, in some context, for some of us, is like, yeah, Father, that's an awesome concept. For other of us, Father was absent, neglectful, abusive, and, and Father could actually be something painful. The same title for two different people can have a totally opposite connotation. The word that brings the most joy to my heart is grandmother. My grandma self, she's with the Lord now, she made my life joyful. Have you heard, what's the term these days, almond mom? Is that what it is? Is anyone familiar with that term? It's basically these TikTok, Instagram moms who show the world how healthy they are by restricting everything they're eating. I see a few smiles in the audience. They know what I'm talking about. You can Google it later, okay? Well, my mom was not to the extreme, but she was a bit of an almond mom because that's why I'm still so skinny. She starved me as a child. It's not that I'm healthy, it's malnutrition. <laughs> but I remember she would not, and she was also a penny pincher, and my mom would not buy anything with sugar in it. That was junk cereal. So on our birthdays, once a year, dad would buy some junk cereal. My mom was so health conscious, she wouldn't even buy the frosted mini wheats. She just brought mini wheats with no frosting at all. It was like death in a bowl. It was horrendous, and she didn't even buy the name brand. She was buying the Walmart ones, which we all know, Walmart, Fruit Loops, and real Fruit Loops, they don't taste the same. If you think they do, you lack class, okay? <laughs> but I remember my mom would buy the cheapest version of the worst cereals. It's just not a great way to start off your day. <laughs> but then I would go to Grandma's house, and Grandma's like, you want cake for breakfast? <laughs> Welcome to Grandma's house. I was like, I love Grandma. My mom grew up on a farm in Indiana, so if me or one of my four brothers weren't actively working, then we were all bums. We didn't always know what we were supposed to be doing, but we knew we weren't supposed to be relaxing. <laughs> and we go to Grandma's house, and it's just sit on the TV, you want me to put on another movie? And, and she would make ramen noodles, but she wouldn't make one pack. It's just me, and she's still cooking in like a witch's vat for 30 people. <laughs> and then she would say, don't worry, you don't have to finish it. Mom would make me sit there while my brother is shoveling his peas under my chair, and I'm getting in trouble for him not eating his food. And I would just sit there all night if I didn't finish. Grandma's house, you didn't have to finish nothing. She was just happy that you existed. When I hear grandma, I have nothing but positive feelings, positive thoughts. And so she shaped the way that I view older people. I typically get along really well with older people because I automatically assume you're old, you might be a good person. <laughs> That's just my experience. And so we see in the scriptures that our culture and our, our family and our experiences often shape the way that we see the world, including the way that we see ourselves. Even the way that we see ourselves is shaped by our culture. If you go to even different parts of the US, there's different kinds of cultures. 
And what I want you to do is take a step back this morning and ask yourself, how much of my view of myself and of the world and of God is shaped by my little circle or have I been willing to completely subject myself to the goodness of God through the scriptures and reevaluate my beliefs, my long held feelings based on the Bible. I was in Malawi, Africa one year, and I was going into what's called the Lower Shiri. And the Lower Shiri is some, one of the poorest places in the world. If there is a lack of rain, immediately you can have thousands of people in danger of starvation. And I partnered with a missionary there who was getting the gospel to these people, bringing emergency aid to them. And I was going into the schools, and with a translator, we were playing some soccer with them or football. And then we'd gather them for two or three hours, preach, let them ask questions. And the Christians in this part of Africa were dead set against pork. They would not eat it. They weren't Seventh-day Adventist. They weren't Muslim, but they would not eat pork. And I'm thinking, why are these Africans in the middle of nowhere so against pork? And they asked me, well, based on the scriptures, isn't pork evil? And I said, what text are you talking about? They said, well, there was that man with the demons, and no one could control him, and he went to Jesus and said, Jesus, have mercy on me. And the demons asked for mercy that Jesus wouldn't torment them before the judgment day came. And so Jesus cast them into the pigs. So clearly, God doesn't like pigs. And so in their minds, this text was clear evidence that all pigs are demon-possessed. I'm sorry, but bacon never did anything harmful to me. If you eat too much, maybe it will, right? But they had these deeply held beliefs based on a cultural assumption, based on a feeling that they had never questioned. And there are some things that we should question, especially if they will bring us greater life. And so I want to ask you this morning, would you allow God to change your mind? Would you allow God to change the way that you see the world, the way that you see yourself? You may have even been raised in church your whole life. But in your home or in your culture, you may have deeply held assumptions that you have never questioned because of the power of a culture, the power of a nation, the power of our lineage. And Jonah had the same problem. You see, Jonah was from what we call the 10 tribes of Israel. There were two southern tribes and they were good. They followed God off and on. The 10 tribes went after idolatry and never again turned back to God. And Jonah was one of the few good ones. And so Jonah says, God, I want you to destroy Nineveh because they're so wicked. But Jonah was coming from a country that was doing things that were just as wicked as Nineveh. So his prejudice against these people was not based on the fact that they were actually more sinful than his own people, but simply that he had a problem we call pride. He found his identity in his nationality. He found his identity in his family lineage instead of his identity in who God said he was. And I want you to know this morning that if you came from a broken, messed up home, you are no less valuable to God than anyone else. I want you to know that if you came from a poor home, you don't have a strong lineage, that if you came from a place in life where you have no means, you didn't get a good chance for education, you are no less valuable to God than anyone else. Because every single person here was made in the image of God. The very first description of man is that we were made in God's image. And yes, we are corrupted by sin. Romans 5 teaches very clearly in verse number 12 that because of one man's sin, sin came on all of us because we all have sinned. Yes, you are a sinner, you are selfish, you are sometimes prideful and entitled, but The core of who you are that Jesus Christ is redeeming is the image of God and you were made in God's image and that makes you valuable. You are not a piece of trash. You are not worthless. You are not simply the summation of the money or the accolades or the success. You are more than your looks. You are more than your financial backing. You are even more than your reputation in your community. You are made in God's image and God loves you. 
You see, but what we have done in culture is we make everyone's value about how much money they make. We, we put people's value on how athletic they are, about how good looking they are, about how famous they are, even about how spiritual they may appear to be. And with all of the scandals from big name preachers in our community, I'm a little less impressed with people's stature and I just wanna know who are you really in your real life? Because what makes people valuable is not how they appear to be, but that God made them in his image. But we're not always very good at seeing ourselves or the world this way, are we? We are enamored with power and excess, and Nineveh was the most powerful nation, did the capital of the Assyrian army, the most powerful nation in the world, but that did not mean that they were not going to face the judgment of God. And so we need to be willing to question long-held beliefs. But number two, I want to see the prejudice of the prophet Jonah. Look at what it says in verse number three of Jonah chapter one. It says, but Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa and he found a ship going to Tarshish so he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. This is kind of ironic that Jonah who is a prophet of God, and we all know that God is omnipresent. We, even our children in Sunday school know this, but Jonah, who should know better, is running from the presence of the Lord. Does anyone find that a little bit ironic? That he is so blinded by his hate. He's so blinded by his prejudice. He's so blinded by his entitlement that he can't even think clearly. And so he pays. I don't know if we have the, the image up there of the map of Jonah going down to Joppa. So we see that Nineveh is 500 miles to the northeast. Jonah goes miles away from his home to Joppa. He pays a quite expensive boat fare to send him 2,500 miles in the opposite direction. I mean, he is running as far as he can possibly get. He's going to a part of Spain that is actually known for wealth, jewels, diamonds. He's like, you know what, God? I don't really want to help these people because I hate them. And so I'm going to run the opposite direction. I'm just going to go get rich. I'm just going to go get what I want because I would rather just care for myself than preach your mercy and grace to these people who I can't stand. So he gets on the boat, and you know the story in verses 4 through 11. God sends a wind. And, And here's the thing, again, about Jonah. He goes down to Joppa, and then it says he goes down into the innermost part of the ship. So the ship is literally in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. It's being torn apart, and Jonah goes down into the boat, and he goes to sleep. Everyone's about to die, and the prophet is like, I don't really care if we die. I don't want to do what God says. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to sleep. So all of these pagan sailors are breaking out their little idols, and, and they're, they're praying to them and offering sacrifices, and they're doing everything they can to save their lives. And the captain goes down into the hole of the ship, and he sees Jonah snoring. And he actually says to him, arise, get up, O oh sleeper. That's his nickname, sleeper. And I'm imagining this rough sailor kicks him, pow. And he says, dude, get up. And call upon the name of your God because we're all going to die and we can't figure out what's going on. So Jonah kind of gets up from his sleep and and he goes up to the top of the ship. And they're all casting lots now to see whose fault it is. So this is an interesting aspect of scripture. They would basically give each man a number and they would take some die and cast the die. And whoever's number came up on the die, it was their fault. And chances of all chances, whose number comes up? Jonas. And so they say, okay, Jonah, the die are saying this is your fault. And Jonah goes, yeah, yeah, it's my fault. I'm a prophet of the Most High God who made heaven and earth. And I worship the one true God, unlike you dirty pagans. And so the one true God has sent this storm to judge me because I'm actually God's prophet. And they're like, oh, so this, this is your fault. He's like, yeah, pretty much. And so they keep praying to their gods and now they're throwing all of their goods off of the ship in order to save their lives. And here's what's interesting. These sailors cared more about Jonah's life than Jonah did about theirs. Jonah is completely wrapped up now in I'm gonna do what I want, I'm gonna get what I want. I don't care what people think, I don't care what people say, I'm going to get my own. 
I'm going to get my riches, I'm going to get my wealth, but I am out of here. And he has no compassion on these sailors around him. So he even says, if you want this to stop, you have to throw me into the ocean. And before they throw Jonah into the ocean, the sailors are like, one true God that this guy says he worships, please don't, don't put this guy's blood on our hands. We didn't want to throw him overboard. We, we tried unladening the ship before we threw him in. But we have no other options now. So they throw Jonah in. He sinks. And the Bible says that all of the sailors repented and believed God. Isn't it amazing that God can even use this punk prophet to save some pagan sailors? But I want to ask you, how much do you reflect the attitude of Jonah in your dealings with the world around you? Let me give you an example. I remember one time there was a man in a church that I was attending and it was during an intense time of politics in our country and he basically started railing against people in California saying, we hate you, we don't want you, you shouldn't even be a part of our country. Does that kind of sound like Jonah to you? And this Christian man had elevated the law and elevated his view of politics above the souls that God had created in his own image. When we look at people who don't agree with us on gender identity or sexual orientation, when we look at people who are different from us on their views of how people should express their sexuality, we do not have to back off the truth. We can still believe that God made man and woman in his image but when we see them, are we like Jonah in that we are somehow better than them because our sins are different and they deserve the full wrath of God? According to the scriptures, there is none righteous, no, not one. According to the scriptures, we are saved by grace through not of yourselves, it is the gift of. And so what we do is we say, well, I've prayed the prayer. And I believe in Jesus, so now I'm kind of up here, but you, you're, you're still kind of down here in your nasty, filthy sin. You're not quite on my level because you don't believe what I believe. Well, if it was not for the grace of God, you could never, ever have gotten saved. And so who are we to point at anyone else and say your sin disqualifies you from the mercy and the love of God? You see, this points us down further in the story. Jonah is in the belly of this great fish, as it is known, maybe a sea monster. Some people scoff at this part of the story and they say, this is so unbelievable that a man could be swallowed by a fish. Well, there, are, a great blue whale has a heart that is as big as a Volkswagen beetle. There are many species of fish and whale and shark that are extinct that were as big if not bigger than the great blue whale. So this story really is not all that improbable, even on a practical level. I mean, some people believe that DNA spontaneously came from inorganic matter, from lightning striking a rock or chemicals being compressed in an ice bubble in the Antarctic and now we have molecules that form DNA. Does that sound like a miracle to you? I'm not even saying that all the smart scientists are wrong. I'm just saying even if they're right, to me that still sounds like a miracle of chance. And so why would we look at a story where a man gets swallowed by a huge sea creature and we're like, oh, that's completely improbable. It, it's really not that far-fetched. Here's what's more far-fetched to me, that Jonah spent three days in the belly of this horrible fish with no food and no water before he repented. Do you know anyone who's stubborn? Don't point at the person next to you. I don't want to be a cause of any spousal fights today, okay? But this guy is so full of self-righteousness. He is so full of hatred and disgust for other people's sins. He actually prophesied to his own people who didn't repent that God would build up the walls and protect them, which happened. But because Israel didn't repent later, Nineveh came and tore down the walls and Jonah knew that God was going to judge his people because even though God blessed them, they didn't repent. 
And so even though Jonah has the knowledge that his own people are wicked and God bless them in spite of it, his identity is so wrapped up in his self-righteousness and his cultural and ethnic superiority that he cannot love and forgive and show mercy to other people. I just want you to know that I am so thankful that God's grace extends to everyone. But here's the thing, we need to take that grace and extend it. We need to extend the mercy and grace of God to people who are different than us, who think differently than us. This does not mean we don't call them to repentance because as we're gonna see, without repentance, God's judgment is going to come. But what we do say is that no matter where you are or how far you've gone, the grace of God is greater than your sin. That's what Romans chapter number five says. But where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. It's like you have a cup of water and it's filled with disease and muck and dirt and spit and you take that cup of water and instead of just rinsing it out, you stick it under the Niagara Falls and it just purifies that cup more than it is even necessary. It just blasts it with water and the idea of where sin did abound, grace did much more abound, that is the idea. It is overflowing, it is abundant and maybe your problem this morning is not that you have harsh judgment against others but you have harsh judgment against yourself and you're still living with guilt over your sin and you're still living with shame over your mistakes this means that you lack faith that God's grace is as big as he says it is because the Bible says that when you confess your sins he is faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. If you are still living with shame and guilt over the sins that you have committed in the past, what you need to do is just like Jonah, you need to come to the grace of God and realize that you don't make amends and make it up to God. He washes you clean. Do you believe that God's grace is really as amazing as he says it is? We like to sing it. We like to talk about I get to go to heaven because of that prayer I prayed a long time ago, but most of us have this sneaking suspicion in our heart that while God loves us, he really just puts up with us, right? I know God saved me, but he doesn't really like me. I said that prayer and I'm right because I dress right and I have the right Bible and I have the right music and, and, but, but really I know deep down that God is just kind of annoyed and disgusted with me. Well, if you read Psalm 139, that is not God's attitude towards you. It says that God saw you when he was forming you in your mother's womb. David was amazed at the number of God's thoughts toward him. And I remember hearing Psalm 139 preached kind of like, You know, if I descend into hell, thou art there. And if I send up into the heavens, thou art there. Kind of like, God is watching you and you can't get away with anything. Kind of like a big, creepy Santa Claus. He sees you when you're sleeping. And he knows when you're awake. And God is kind of always watching to get you. But the heart of Psalm 139 is that no matter what you are going through, whether in the depths or in the heights, God's love and compassion will not fail you. And this is the problem that Jonah has is because he does not want this for others and he doesn't see his need for it himself. So we see the patience of God on Jonah as three days he's in the the whale, finally he repents, the whale spits him out. Finally, he goes to preach, and and look at what it says in Jonah chapter number three and verse number five. Jonah chapter three, verse number five. So the people of Nineveh believe God. But first, let's go back to verse number two. God says to Jonah, arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now, Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. Most people think that's three days' journey in circumference, circumference around. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey and cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Now, we don't know if this is the whole message or not. But I'm kind of picturing Jonah reluctantly going through the town. And if they had cardboard back then, I could see him having one of those cardboard signs like in New York, repent, right? And I just see Jonah going through 40 days, knowing Nineveh's gonna be overthrown, 
40 days, Nineveh is going to be overthrown, and he is reluctantly proclaiming the judgment of God because that's actually what he wants. He doesn't want to see people forgiven. He doesn't want to see people given grace. He wants to see the full judgment of God come down on his enemies. But in verse number five, it says, so the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. Even Nineveh repented. And look at verse number nine. The king says, who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way and God repented of the evil that he said that he would do unto them and he did it not. It starts in verse number five with them believing in the evidence of their faith. Their salvation did not come from their works, but the evidence of their faith was that they turned away from the evil works they were doing. Sometimes we like to live Christianity as like, it's, it's all okay, it's all good. Everything's good, it's all okay. Everything's gonna work out. But the Bible says that in order to receive God's full blessing, you don't earn God's blessing. It's always through grace, which is undeserved kindness, undeserved favor. But in order to qualify as a recipient of grace, we must repent. In order to qualify as a recipient of grace, we must repent. And what I'm thankful for is how patient God is in giving us time to repent. Because I, I wanna make you, I wanna say this kindly, but self-righteousness is just as sinful as fornication. Pride is just as detestable to God as homosexuality. God resisteth the, but gives grace to the, you see, humility is a state that does not earn you grace. You don't earn grace. It's always undeserved, but it qualifies you for it. This morning, on the way to church, I was speeding. I didn't know I was speeding because it was coming across that bridge from Pensacola into, into Pace, and I haven't crossed that bridge in a few months because I just got back from being overseas, and I forgot that it goes from 55 to 35. And I was still going a little bit over 55 in the 35. <laughs> and I saw the lights and I started praying for grace. <laughs> this morning I did not receive grace. <laughs> I received the full extent of the law <laughs> twice. I also didn't know my tags were expired. <laughs> So I got a double whammy. If anyone wants to give to the recovering speeding addict fund, you can write your checks to me afterwards. I got the full extent of the law. I've been given grace before. I've been pulled over before and they let me off on a warning maybe once. <laughs> I've been shown grace before. Jesus tells a story so we know clearly what grace is. There were a bunch of men who were hired by a worker and he was gonna pay them a penny a day or a day's wage. And they worked all day. Then some men were waiting around halfway through the day to get work and Jesus goes, uh, the, the, the owner of the land says, hey, do you want some work? And they're like, yeah, we need work. You see, we have to understand that in an agricultural society where people live hand to mouth, people do literally sit around waiting for work sometimes. It's not like just go get a job or just go start a business. It doesn't work like that in the third world. If you have no means, you can't just go work at the shop down the road because there is no shop down the road. There's the field down the road. And if they already have hired all of the laborers for the harvest, you literally have nothing you can do if your family did not give you land. So we are looking at a society where the poor people are 100% dependent on the wealthy in order to survive which is why James is so harsh on the rich people for withholding wages from the poor because they have no other options. Aren't you glad you live in a country where we have thousands of options to make a living? Sometimes the options stink, but at least you can make a living. But this is a society where they were completely dependent and there were some people at the end of the day who had not found work and the landowner come and says, why, have, why aren't you guys working? And they said, we, we couldn't find any work today. And so they work for about an hour of the 10 to 12 hour work day and they get just as much as the rest of the workers. How many of you, if you were the person who worked one hour and that guy gave you enough food to eat that day, how many of you would really love that guy? Did you earn the day's wages? 
Do you deserve the day's wages? But you worked an hour, but you don't earn it. That's Jesus' picture of grace. But then you have the people who worked all day, and they're ticked off. They're like, that's not fair. That's not fair that I worked all day, and you gave them the same thing that you gave me. They don't deserve it. And the owner says, are you mad at me because I'm so good? Are you mad at me because I am so kind? I gave you exactly what you deserved. You agreed for it at the beginning of the day. Why are you mad at me because I'm actually a very kind, merciful person? Sometimes people who don't deserve it get good lives. And if we're honest, according to the scriptures, that's every single person on earth. And I don't say that to shame you, but to make you very aware that every good thing you have, especially being born in a country with the benefits and opportunities that you have, you didn't earn it, but you sure can thank God for it. And so Jonah had this idea that the patience of God should not be shown to others, even as it was being shown to him. Even as Jonah is in the belly of the whale for three days fighting God's call to repentance, he is receiving again and again the mercy and the grace and the patience of God, but doesn't want to show it to others, which leads us to the problem of grace. And that, that gets us right to chapter number four. These Ninevites were incredibly wicked, but look at how Jonah describes God's character in verse number two. Jonah chapter number four Verse number one, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly and he was angry. He was angry at God's mercy and grace. Verse number two, and he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my own country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish for I knew, I knew that you're angry and I knew that you're short-tempered and I was scared of you because you're a really big mean God. Is that what Jonah says? He says, I ran away because I knew that you are gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and I knew that you would change your mind about the judgment. Is this the way you see God? The Bible says very clearly in Psalm 145, 8, the Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. The Lord is good to all and his tender mercies are over all his works. Sometimes we don't see God this way because one time we read a story in the Old Testament about a guy touching the ark as it was about to fall off the cart and God killed him. And so we tend to filter God through one bad experience. If I filter all cops after my experience today, I'd be like, all cops are jerks. They have no mercy, no compassion. We can sometimes filter how we see things or people through one experience. Do you agree with that? You have one bad experience, so all people are this way. All churches are this way. All pastors are this way. And you can have one bad experience and filter God or a person or a group of people or a position through that one filter from that one experience and the rest of your life you hold to that. And some of us, our view of God is that he's up there with a big stick just waiting to judge us. And so we live locked down tight, unforgiving and ungracious towards others, constantly afraid, and we don't live our lives out of love or mercy or grace. We live our lives constantly out of fear. The Bible does say the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, but the Bible also says that if you do not have love, you are nothing. 1 John 4, 8, he that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is. 1 Corinthians 13 says that if you have all faith to remove mountains, you give your body to be burned, and you give everything you have to feed the poor, but you do not have love, it profits you Nothing. You see, the fear of the Lord is the beginning because it keeps us from being stupid. But full maturity in the Christian life is I'm no longer serving God because I'm afraid of bad things happening to me. That's selfish. I'm serving God, forgiving and loving others because God is so gracious and merciful and patient with me. Most of the churches that I've been in in the last 12 years of ministry use fear and guilt and shame to motivate people but Jesus Christ used love and mercy and grace. You see, if you give your tithe because you're afraid of God blowing your tires the next week, you didn't do it because you love God, you did it because you love yourself. 
If you don't cheat on your spouse because you're afraid they're going to leave you, what if they said, you can do whatever you want and I will never leave you? Okay, good, then I'm going to go sleep around. That would show that your love was out of fear and not of sincerity. And so much of us live our entire lives serving God out of fear. And then when we get to the place where we're doing pretty good, now I'm not struggling with that addiction. Now I'm not struggling with that besetting sin. Now I'm not struggling with that anymore so I can stand up here and judge you forgetting that the only way you got there was because of how patient and merciful God is with you. And it also fails to take into account the experiences that other people have had. Look at the end of this story. Jonah is more upset about the plant dying than he is about (laughs) people who could die. And, And it says in verse number nine, and God said to Jonah, doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? And Jonah said, I do well to be angry, even unto death. Have you ever seen those kids throwing a temper tantrum in the store? This is a grown man throwing a toddler temper tantrum (laughs) with God. How many of you agree that Jonah, the way he speaks and treats to God, how many of you agree that God is pretty patient with Jonah? If I were God, I'd be like, poof, you don't exist. (laughs) But God just puts up with this dude's arrogance and impetuousness and just is so patient. God is more patient with us often than we are with each other. God is more patient with us sometimes than we are of ourselves because Satan and ourselves, we bring up our past sins and keep beating ourselves up and God is going, I already forgave that. I cast that into the depths of the sea. I removed that as far as the east is from the west. And now you and or Satan are elevating judgment above the judgment of God and no one has the right to do that. Do you believe God is as merciful and patient and loving as his word says he is? We're afraid to preach this. We are afraid to preach grace because if we preach grace, everyone's just gonna run off in sin. Well, that shows they weren't really walking in grace in the first place. Well, if we preach grace, then people aren't gonna be scared into doing the right thing. Well, that just shows that they were doing it for the wrong motives in the first place. God is not impressed with morality. God is not impressed with religion. The Pharisees prayed three times a day, wore the Bibles on their head, but their hearts were far from God. God is not impressed with your efforts. God is impressed with your faith and your dependence and your humility. But you see, Jonah didn't have those concepts because he was from God's people and he was a prophet and he was better than everyone else. And so he had the right to be angry. He has a right to be angry unto death over a plant. I tried putting some plants in my house. I Airbnb it when I'm out of the country and I came back and some of my my plants were dead. Do I have the right to get angry and threaten to kill myself because my plants died? (laughs) It's pretty ridiculous, but look at what God says so patiently with Jonah in verse number 10. Then said the Lord, thou hast had pity on the gourd, which you didn't even labor, for thou hast not labored, and you neither made it grow. It came up in a night and perished in a night, and should not I spare Nineveh, that great city wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left, and get this, and also much cattle. God even cares about the cows. God even cares about the animals. Because originally, in creation, was Adam supposed to run around kicking all the animals or naming them? The Bible says that God even knows when two sparrows fall to the ground. And you're of more value, value than many sparrows. God even actually cares about creation. We are not to dominate creation. We are to rule over it in benevolence. And you see, Jonah had less mercy than God did, and and God knew all of the sins of Nineveh. God says that they cannot discern between their right hand and their left. Some people think think that means that they were children, but this city was not big enough to have 120,000 children. And what God is saying is Nineveh, because of their ancestry and their lineage and the paganism that they were given from their parents, Jonah, they actually didn't know any better. If you were raised in a family where you knew nothing of God and you knew, and everyone you knew drank, smoked, accepted certain sins, what would you believe is okay? If you were raised in a family that was Islamic, what would you probably be? 
Yes, we never excuse sin, but God even takes into account the circumstances that got people to where they are, and if they will repent, God is slow to anger. God is slow to anger. So what do we see? We see the power of parents. We see the prejudice of the prophet. Prideful, self-righteous, no patience. (laughs) We see that God is more patient than we ever esteem him to be, but we kind of fail to see how patient he is with us. And then finally, we see the problem of grace. And the problem of grace is that it is always undeserved. And that's a problem when you think about it like this. What if somebody is a murderer and on their deathbed, they repent? Does that person deserve grace? And what if someone lives their whole life meeting out philanthropy, wealthy, prideful but wealthy, and they do philanthropy, but they do not repent, do they receive eternal life? The moment we think that we deserve or have earned God's blessings, we forget that every good and perfect gift is from God and it's given by his grace. You see, Israel did not receive the promised land because they were better. God actually said, I'm giving you the promised land because of how wicked they are, but the moment you think you deserve it, then I will push you out just like I pushed them out. God gave it to Israel because they obeyed, but that doesn't mean you earned it. You were born in America and you have American rights, amen? But did you earn it? No. In the same way, when you become a child of God, you inherit all of God's grace, not because you earned it, but because God is merciful and gracious and slow to anger. If that is not the God you believe in, then I want to say this morning, you are not believing in who God says he is because that is God's description of himself in Exodus 34. God's description of himself is merciful, slow to anger, gracious and of great kindness. Are we showing this? Are we believing this? Are we accepting this? Is this the God that we believe in? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your mercy and your grace. You look past our masks of spirituality. You look past our charisma, our fame. You look past our education, You look past all of our efforts and you see our hearts. And in spite of the sin, you see you love us and you're slow to anger. Father, even though I preach this message from the Bible, there are some here who will resist it just like the Pharisees resisted Jesus. But there are some here who are struggling with sin. There are some here who are ready to repent of pride and self-righteousness. There are some here who are ready to show mercy and grace to others and I pray that God we would see you for who you say you are that we would believe in the depths of your mercy and your grace and your patience and kindness that we would let go of our own perceptions of you and cling to the ones that you give us in scripture we always have at the end of our services what we call an invitation it's a time of reflection and so this morning, if, if God spoke to you, I, I would just like to be honest, to be encouraged by it and just to say a prayer for you and invite you to respond publicly. If you say, Mike, I think that I have been lacking God's grace towards others and I want to repent of that today, would you raise your hand? I have lacked God's grace towards others and I want to repent of that today. Would you just raise your hand? Thank you. You can put those hands down. I wonder who would say, I have been prideful and self-righteous and today I, I want to fully believe and depend on the grace of God that every blessing in my life is because of his goodness and I want to live a more humble life dependent on God's grace and I want to repent of my self-righteousness if that's you would you raise your hand I want to repent of that today thank you for your humility and honesty you can put your hands down how many of you would say I, I sometimes struggle with guilt and shame from my past There are things that I've done, mistakes I've made that continue to haunt me. And today I want to receive the depths of God's forgiveness and mercy and I want to lay that down and I want to believe in God's grace and and no longer live in guilt and shame of what God has forgiven because of Jesus Christ. Would you raise your hand if that's you? 
I want to leave that behind me. Praise God, you can put your hands down. The music team is, is going to play, and this is a time for you to pray. Maybe there's somebody you need to forgive, somebody who has definitely wronged you, and, and you don't have to go be that person's best friend. You can definitely put some boundaries there, but maybe there's somebody who has wounded you, and you need to forgive them the way God has forgiven you. And so as the singers sing and the instruments play, would you just take a moment and thank God for his grace. Thank God for his mercy. Would you pray and, and believe and receive the depth of his patience and his grace that he has for you? Would you repent of self-righteousness and judgment? This doesn't mean you have to go vote differently or anything, but it's about your heart towards people. It's about your, the way you see them and your response toward them. So would you ask God to give you a, a heart like his that is patient and merciful? Savior and my God, with Christ my Savior and my God. Verse 3, behold him there. Behold him there, the risen Lamb, my perfect spotless righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the King of my Savior and my God, with Christ my Savior and my God. I would be, <clears throat> I would be failing as a preacher this morning if I did not mention the gospel. The reason that God will forgive you and cleanse you and receive you is because on the cross, Jesus Christ took all of your sins. Every ounce of judgment that God ever had towards you when you repent, Jesus takes it. On the cross, all of God's anger was taken and when he died, he buried your sins in the grave and he rose and he offers you eternal life. You do not get to heaven because you go to church. You do not go to heaven because you pray or because you give money. The only way to know God and have eternal life is through faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. Jonah did not yet see that. He knew the grace of God, but we see the fullness of God's love. The Bible says, here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the payment for our sins. If you are here looking for answers, if you are here looking for God, if you are here looking for forgiveness, it is yours because of Jesus Christ, the son of God who died for your sins. You don't earn it. You don't church your way into it. You simply believe that Jesus has provided it through his death on the cross. You are absolutely loved and you are absolutely forgiven because of what Jesus did for you. If you have not fully understood that, if you want to learn more about how you can have the Holy Spirit assurance of eternal life, please come talk to me. Talk to anyone on the platform. Talk to any one of the staff members. We're gonna have people here at a welcome desk. If you're like, I need to know that I'm forgiven. I need to know that I'm going to heaven. I need to know that my sins are forgiven. You can have that assurance today because the grace of God was on full display in the cross of Jesus Christ. So I cannot finish the message if I do not mention Jesus because the whole Bible is about him. So if you are looking for forgiveness, for grace, and for mercy, you find that in the blood of Jesus that was shed because God loves you. That is the whole reason that Jesus came is to show the depth of God's love and desire to redeem you. 
So let's conclude in prayer. We'll have the announcements, but I wanna thank God before I finish for the sacrifice and blood of Jesus that proves the grace of God for us. Will you pray, pray with me and thank God for that amazing grace? Father, thank you so much for Jesus who stands before us now. Jesus who is before you interceding on our behalf, who holds back the wrath and judgment, not because you want to judge us, but because you don't want to judge us, because you want to forgive us. God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his mercy. Thank you for the resurrection. There are some here who do not have full assurance of their forgiveness, of their acceptance. And I pray that today they would get it settled through faith in Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for us. Thank you for the resurrection, that we have hope that we will spend eternity with God. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're visiting today, we thank you for being here. Uh, we have You should have got one of these visitor cards when you came in the door today. Uh, if not, uh, there'll be a number up on the screen you can text welcome to. Uh, you can fill that out or you can fill this out and drop it off over here to Trey over here at the Next Steps wall. Uh, and make sure we get one of those in your hands. Uh, also, I want to mention our uh, summer highlights coming up uh, this year. Uh, and so Ben Shetler, he's going to be here uh, preaching next uh, Sunday and then the following Wednesday and the following Sunday after that and the Wednesday after that. So he's going to be uh, preaching some of his Truth and Love series uh, with us, so don't miss that. And then June 4th, we're going to have our promotion Sunday. Uh, this is going to be a good day, so make sure you're here for that. Kingdom Builders start up uh, June 7th uh, on Wednesday nights, so uh, that's going to be exciting. But I also want to mention one more thing. Before you go today, make sure you grab one of these invite cards at each door. This is our 50th anniversary invite card. We want to make sure people come on July 8th and July 9th uh, to celebrate what God has been doing here at West Florida Baptist Church for the last 50 years. Okay, so make sure you grab some of these and make sure you plan to attend uh, that day here uh, with us. Chuck, why don't you come? A couple more announcements. We'll get you guys out of here. The new members. We have some new members today. Uh, Aaron Maynard and Lydia, you guys here today? Right here, if you guys go ahead and stand, clap for them. Welcome to our, to our church. All the time in staff meeting, I'm always praising God for the people of West Florida. I love the people here, I love the community, and that's what people are looking for. They're looking for that, that church where they feel apart and feel loved. And we have another family, the Mises, Josh and Karen Mise. Do you guys wanna stand for me? Where are you guys at? Right here. There we go. Go ahead and give, welcome them to our church. Tonight is no connect class, so enjoy that time with your family. I know many of us have off tomorrow, but enjoy that time with your family. And then as well, next steps. We've talked about summer. Graduations are all done. Thank the Lord. Um, you, many of you guys have uh, a lot of things that are happening um, for the summer. We would love for you to be a part of what is going on here, um, whether that is you taking that step um, to become a member or helping us out in the areas um, that we need some holes filled. So come by and see us at the Next Steps wall. If you guys have any questions, we're here to help you. Let's go ahead and close.